Okay, we should be live. Okay. Got my kombucha. Kombucha is good. It's very good. It's a little, uh, took some getting used to, but I appreciate it. Waiting for some people to get on. Um, tonight's going to be a pretty short stream. It's Passover tonight. Um, and we're going to talk about what that, the lessons are from Passover, how that impacts our world today, the way that we work in our corporate environments, and, um, you know, even our academic institutions, because I think it was a year ago today that I did my first stream on Theory of Everyone. And uh, I'm going to double check that now, but I'm pretty sure that it was during Passover. Just double check here. I think I called it Escaping Our Academic Institutions. We are one subscriber away from 250 subscribers on YouTube. That's pretty awesome. Okay. Yeah, Escaping Our Academic Institutions. Share screen. Talking. Right here. This video. Well, that it only took a virus turning into a pandemic and potentially the complete destruction of the global economy. But I'm here today to start streaming again because I want to first talk about coronavirus and essentially why coronavirus is exactly what we needed. It is exactly what we needed. Old school intro, guys. But I made this 11 months ago, April 2nd, so almost 12 months ago. That was my first video back after a long hiatus due to all kinds of things. But, you know, just professional, necessary, professionally necessary break, I guess. Gosh, it is hot in here. It is becoming summer again. Need to, like get a studio one day that just is cool. Uh, but I made that video 11 months ago, almost 12 months ago, and it was about how coronavirus was going to help free us from our current institutions involved in academia, in media, in the work environment. And I remember Shortly before that, I was speaking to my boss at PragerU, and I was like, you know, we were, it was the day that we were all going to leave uh, and go, like, on lockdown. And I looked at him, and we were all closing up the, uh, the office, and we knew we weren't coming back for at least a couple weeks. And... I was like, I think this is the beginning of a whole new world. And he was like, no, it'll be fine. Like in like two weeks, we'll be back. And this is going to be no big deal. And I was like, I don't know about that, man. That doesn't really make any sense when you think about what a virus is. And um, like, regardless of how, you know, deadly it is or virulent or, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. Like the idea that we would be back to normal in two weeks just didn't make any sense to me. And so, obviously, we're not back in two weeks. And um, I highly suggest that you take a look at that video, uh, Escaping Academic Institutions, because I, it really goes into depth 
as to like what sparked this project because not what sparked the project but what like gave me like the kick in the ass to like start streaming and it was that it was that moment of like being stuck at home realizing the world was on the verge of change and that you know for so long i had sat there and thought about how do we escape our academic institutions how do we escape our our you know corporate environments and i just didn't know like i was like it's going to take an act of god well lo and behold a virus escapes a lab in wuhan allegedly allegedly and we are then you know a year later still in a whole new world and honestly it's a good thing there's a lot of negatives but it's also a very good thing i think that people are having problems going back to the way that things were but there is this portion in the bible where i think it's lot leaves sodom or Gomorrah, one of the two and he's like walking away with his family and his wife turns and she looks back and she, they're told not to look back it's like don't look back she looks back she turns into a pillar of salt and i forever was like that's just ridiculous like how can anybody believe the bible what do you mean turned into a pillar of salt and then um, i had that whole just perspective shift and i was just able it seemed to just interpret scripture in a useful way at least not saying it's the only way i'm just saying it's a useful way and instead of looking at that and being like nobody turns into a pillar of salt i was like she became salty you know when somebody's upset and they're bitter and they're angry they get salty that's what happened to his wife she looked back and she wanted you know the fancy shops and the fancy shoes and the the nights on the town and the mimosas and whatever else uh, comes with that and you know she wanted to go back to the way that things were and she saw though it was just being destroyed behind her and just made her salty that they had to leave this is how i feel like a lot of people are these days are like blaming the media on the right if you're on the right you're blaming the media and you're like why did you make us upend our lives they didn't make us upend our lives god did and if you're angry about that then you're looking back i want to look forward and i was thinking about this a lot because you know one of the things that pissed me off more than anything honestly more more than anything about the entire right because i you know i worked for prager U and i had uh come from you know kind of like the upper echelons essentially of like the right i i'd seen those behind the scenes conversations of the these thinkers on that side of the fence and all these people that usually were so focused on god not one of them not one of the people that i can think of off the top of my head for at least like eight nine ten months probably up until now almost i can think of one person that's starting to come around and that's it everybody else on the right not a single one asked why is god given us the coronavirus what is he trying to teach us because it's an enormous amount it's just a ridiculous notion that you know you're this is just an annoyance or just you know a bunch of people ruining society it's like society was ruined and if you didn't realize that 
then you weren't really paying attention. Our schools aren't teaching anymore. They're teaching you how to, they are not teaching. They are restricting you from learning how to learn. Our political institutions had ground to a halt to the point where they were too corrupt to be overthrown, too incompetent to get anything done. Our academic institutions is the exact same thing, too corrupt to be overthrown, too incompetent to get anything done. And we needed something to start destroying it. And so I look at this, this virus, as kind of freeing. And that's how I want to look at it tonight a little bit with relating it to Passover, because there is this angel of death in Passover. It is the, you know, Moses goes to Pharaoh and he's like, let my people go. They're just, Pharaoh doesn't want to let people go. But God sends all these plagues. Each time doesn't work, doesn't work, doesn't work. Last one. It's an angel of death. It's basically a virus, it seems like. And uh, everybody has to, one of the, you know, the, the Israelites have to put blood from a lamb on their door. And I'm still trying to think about exactly what this means. But, uh, and if, if you didn't do that, then the virus essentially passed through your household and it killed the firstborn male. It says the firstborn son, but son is a male. What's interesting about this is, that sounds like coronavirus. People think about it as like, you know, your oldest little kid who's a boy. What? It's the firstborn male child of the house, essentially, but it really, it's, it doesn't even, I don't even know if it says child. It just says first, firstborn son. Firstborn son is firstborn male. Look at the coronavirus, you know, death statistics when it first started. Look who was most impacted. It was like old men. You know, that that is not a coincidence that's meaningless at all. And I think that, that there's a lot that we should, you know, for the, the fact that the right-wing people in the political world who so often just claim God as part of their their ideology didn't look at that and identify it is insane it just showed that they had become useless and uh, they were just react reactionary to the left that's exactly what I mean by even our political institutions have become incompetent too corrupt to be overthrown too incompetent to do anything good and that is as true of the right as it is of the left. You know, one of them actively screws things up. The other one just constantly, you know, lets them do it and doesn't uh, fix things. It just reacts and complains. That's just as bad. If you're not building, but you're upset that everything's decaying around you, it's partially your fault. Things decay. You have to actively build. There is no staticness. You don't get to just rest on your laurels. You have to build actively. And so I really see a lot of parallels between um, what we've experienced, you know, with this pandemic over the past year and um, what happened in the story in Egypt. I had this phrase that I kind of came up with last year, and it was, there are two pharaohs in Egypt. Because everybody expects Pharaoh to be just, you know, Gavin Newsom or like Joe Biden or Donald Trump. It's like, what if Pharaoh is also your uh, employer keeping you from your family during the day? What if Pharaoh is, you know, the school that keep your children in a classroom all day long and forbid them from learning how to learn. These are also pharaohs. There are more than one pharaoh. There, there is more than one pharaoh. There's multiple pharaohs. 
And firstborn child is Farsi from elderly sick people with several existing complications. It's a far cry from elderly sick people. Firstborn male. It's not firstborn child. It's firstborn male. The parallel is there. You just have to open your eyes and see it. I'm not saying that it's meant to be exact. It's not. But the Bible, the Torah, is not what happened. It's what happens again and again and again and again. Including over the past year. So, there's two ways to look at the way that th things are going in the world. One of them is that we are becoming freed. And the other one is that we are being enslaved. And I've talked before about how the truth, the absolute truth, is always a superposition structure, which means two things that appear to be opposites are happening at the same time because on some level they are dependent. That is also true of you know this no man is a Faroe Island Jack I don't know what that means exactly but I'm guessing no man is an island which is true no man is an island but I don't know what you mean by that maybe you can elaborate I would like to hear um, frog plague should have been seen as a peace offering probably depends on the frogs some frogs are cool I mean all frogs are cool but like it'd be neat if they were like colorful frogs <laughs> like poison dart frogs or something as long as you're not accidentally eating them but um, yeah I've never understood like it's you know Pharaoh sends flies and then he sends frogs it's like it sounds like Frogs may have been a peace offering to eat the flies, but they still rejected it regardless. I um, hope you are all well tonight. You too, Chris. I do want to say, last week, uh, Thursday night, we all, um, well, not we all, but like probably six of us, I think, five, five four, four or five, six of us, something like that, were on the Discord server our new discord server link is in the description of this video and it should be in the um bio of my instagram as well highly suggest you join that we're going to do that again this week it went until three o'clock in the morning that was a little late but it was so much fun i had a blast getting to know uh those of you that showed up it i really felt like i got to know everybody that was in there and uh, everybody that was that did show up there all taught me things like it was very cool um, and it was a much more two-way discussion than this is and that is you know I to be honest I, I was expecting to get to know you guys but I wasn't honestly expecting to know to to have those who showed up teach me as much as they did and it was very cool it was a great conversation yeah highly suggest you join um, uh, you get to hear, I get to hear your voice, you get to hear the voices of everybody else here. It gets to be a much more semi-private discussion too. It's not streamed, um, and I'm going to keep it that way because, um, unless it's some kind of event that I announce, you know, beforehand, but for the most part, they're going to be just not streamed, not recorded. I'm going to ask everybody that they don't ever post any recordings from there. Um, if I do find out that anybody posted recordings from there that I don't want posted, I'm gonna, and like, I haven't ironed out the rules yet, so, but I will, I'll make it very clear, but that will be a way to get kicked out of the Discord. Like, if you post things that are supposed to be private publicly, gone. So, there will be, but, but, an, the opportunity to have private, more private conversations on there. Um, and it's in a much more, like, intimate type environment uh, because you can hear everybody's voice and it's a smaller group. But it was totally awesome. No, sorry, no, just joking, Pharaoh. Oh, Pharaoh, okay, yeah, very fine. Yep. Um, I, I didn't, um, I read the F and it just didn't, it didn't, it went right over my head. 
but yeah it was an awesome discussion on the discord um i yeah finished it like 5 30 eastern time it was like 3 30 this time uh we can't do that again most likely but it was a great time i it didn't get started until a bit later it's probably why it went so late but and this, like I said, this one's going to be a bit shorter because it's Passover and I have plans with Paulina, but uh, it was it was awesome. Definitely going to do that again this week. At least once a week, we're going to do a Discord discussion like that and uh, instead of this. So, but, you know, the beginning of the week, I always do 9 p.m. because I have a class until 8.45 uh, normally. And so it's going to be kind of shorter on Mondays, but... I wanted to go over a few things that are interesting. One, uh, this week in the Discord, at least, and maybe also on a stream, we'll go over it a bit more. But we're gonna, I'm gonna go, I'm going to teach how to build the quantum of consciousness model, which is um, right. Uh, right here. I'm going to teach everybody how to build this. And like I said, if you don't have um, Excel, then you can do it on Google uh, Drive. I'm probably going to start by teaching it on the Discord because then I can answer your questions like in, uh, like in voice so it's it's very easy to just speak back and forth but i want to start teaching people how to build this and um i think that'll be a good time but the other thing that i wanted to show you guys actually is there is a dis interesting discussion happening tomorrow on brian keating's YouTube channel, Dr. Brian Keating. So, definitely, Brian Keating, I have worked with before uh, for PragerU. We did um, this video, God or the Multiverse. I love this video. I actually think that it's not God or the multiverse. It's God and the multiverse are full true, but um, how did we get here? But still, me, the logic me. holds. Not just you and me, but the whole shebang. How is any kind of life possible? The universe is a hostile place. Solar flares, cosmic rays, asteroids flying about. The odds against our existence are truly astronomical. Take it from me. I'm an astrophysicist. My job is to look out into space at stars and galaxies, trying to answer these basic how did the universe come to be questions. Well, those who have a religious faith have an answer. God. The Earth's distance from the sun, the size of the atom, and a thousand other things, large and small, that allow us to live and to breathe and to think, all seem perfectly tuned for our existence. To many, this design suggests a designer. But from a purely scientific point of view, the faithful have a big problem. They can offer no indisputable proof for this belief because of the lack of hard evidence. That's not it's true. Not surprising that over seventy percent of the members of the National Academy of Sciences declare themselves to be atheists. That's a problem. They have a big problem too. Absent a creator, how did they account for the existence of the universe, of planet Earth, of human consciousness? How do they account for the existence of anything? Yep. Well, it turns out they have an answer, and it's become all the rage in scientific circles. It's called the multiverse, and according to many scientists, our universe isn't the whole ballgame. Far from it. These scientists argue that there's an awful lot of universes out there, not just one or two, but an infinite number of them. Let me explain. 13.8 billion years ago. There's only one universe. It is also a multiverse, and it is a chain of verses. And that's the one verse. And right here is a the beginnings of a verse chain. One leading to the next. But they're within each other. So this bottom one is within the one above it. 
and then the one there's one within that one and one within that one and one within that one and that's just how it goes but um, it seems to be a logical inevitability but what I wanted to show you is that actually on Brian Keating's podcast uh, podcast or YouTube channel uh, which is into the impossible he does a great show highly recommend subscribing uh, maybe we can have him on here one day, but it's going to be a while. Uh, like, I know how that goes. But eventually, maybe we can have him on. But, uh, hey, if we're really successful, maybe eventually we'll go on his. But uh, we have some work to do before that happens. But this is going to be an interesting one. This is tomorrow at 8 a.m. And it is Stephen Meyer. And he wrote a book, I guess, called The Return of the God Hypothesis. I'm really excited to watch this. Um, and I just set a reminder for myself. And I suggest that you guys uh, check it out too. And then we can talk about it afterwards. I want to see what your thoughts are. I want to talk about what my thoughts are. But this is right here. The Return of the God Hypothesis is this right here scientific s sentient singularity theory is monotheism in a scientific context this is the return of the god hypothesis and this is the name of the theory and um I want to see what he has to say. I think he actually debated, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, worst science guy in the world, Bill Nye. And I used to like Bill Nye as a kid, but like, you know, he's, some people sell this souls, or at least they seem to, I don't want to judge. I don't want to judge, but he's lost his way. It seems maybe, but, um, he debated Stephen Meyer many years ago, and I remember I was rooting for Bill Nye, and I was like, get him, Bill Nye. And I would love to see what Stephen Meyer has to say on Brian Keating's podcast. I think that it just, it's just, I love the, it just even the way that this book looks. Let's look it up. Return of the God, the Jedi. God hypothesis. Stephen Meyer audiobook. I might have to get this book. And maybe it's not new. Oh, it is new. It's not even able to be released yet. Pre-order now. Good for you, dude. Stephen Meyer. Three scientific discoveries that reveal the mind behind the universe. Super, super stoked for his, his talk. And I highly suggest checking it out on Brian Keating's uh, um, YouTube channel. Into the Impossible. Should be a good, good, uh, good talk. So... Let's see here. Believers have the word in the Bible books. Chapter this verse that. Science, the multiverse. Yeah, no, that's fascinating too. I I didn't even like think about that. You know, believers. Someone in the um in the Instagram chat just uh just okay yeah it's working. Okay, someone in the Instagram chat wrote that believers have the word which is. It's filled with verses. You know, the scripture is filled with verses. It's a multiverse. It's like believers have their own multiverse. That's a good way to put that. And uh, um, and we have, you know, also the multiverse chain, which is a double helix chain of verses. And, um, you know, we, we all have verses. Well, I mean, I guess most people watching this would have 
sentient singularity theory and all the science that has been done by others to back up this theory and then also have scripture but um you know at the end of the day we all have just multiverses that's pretty cool um I remember something about firstborn males generally getting the first and largest portions of food. This could be death for someone with family whose grain had gone bad or had something else. Interesting. I liked when he grew grass on his car, Bill Nye. Yeah. That was, dead. That was a long time ago. But I, I, I'm really excited to listen to that discussion. You know... Here's the issue for me, like, with a lot of these people like Stephen Meyer, is they start from the premise. They're almost like the, the atheists or the anti-theists arguing against God's existence. It's the... It's... And he, I, I know he does a better job than most, but it's still so speculative and it just, it discounts like a lot of times like quantum physics. It's like, how can we make, you know, it's like that God of the gaps argument of like, what explains the Cambrian explosion? It's like that to me is not an argument, but, um, but there are, when you, more you understand quantum physics, the more you understand that this is a mind, it seems. And then once you grasp the pattern described in sentient singularity theory that is persistent across all fields, not just quantum physics, and you realize that it is the structure of mind itself, you realize that God is a logical inevitability. There aren't just arguments for God. There is evidence abound that's different i came at this as an atheist self-described really an anti-theist trying to understand consciousness because i was trying to understand artificial general intelligence the pattern that i ended up mapping to understand consciousness i found in every single field and that means that it is It's if you if you assume that what you're seeing is real, then you have to assume that it's broken up into that pattern because we're inside of a mind, because that is the pattern of mind. Or you can say, well, that's just the way we observe it because we are a mind. But I mean, you'd have to are you would literally in order to argue that this isn't a mind, you would have to argue that we don't see reality. And you couldn't tell us, if we don't see reality, then you couldn't tell us also what was on the other side of that, that lens. And therefore, why are you arguing against what you're seeing? It doesn't mean that, you know, there isn't an argument for it. It just means you'll never see it. So you can't really logically argue against it either. Otherwise, you'd have to argue against everything that you see ever. Like, stop arguing the sky is blue. Stop arguing, you know, I don't know, anything else that you want to argue. And um, that doesn't just, that just is so logically, like, just useless. <laughs> and uh, that nobody would do that. So, definitely... Um, Definitely looking forward to that discussion, but I do understand uh, Stephen Meyer. I don't know his background. Let's see this. Stephen Meyer. Did he was he a philosopher of science? In, okay. Received his PhD in the philosophy of science, University of Cambridge. Awesome. I mean, I have no faith in the university system, but good for him that he has the credentials. He said, 
The explosive origin of animal life and the case for intelligent design in Times Literacy Supplement Book of the Year, Signature in the Cell, DNA, and the Evidence for Intelligence Design. DNA definitely is evidence for intelligent design. I don't know everything that he has... Oh, we have, we did a video with him? Um, for PragerU, when did this happen? Okay, October 2019. So, like, very recent. Evolution. You learned about it in high school. Okay, we're going to watch this because these are my old employer. And uh, I want to see the video they did with Stephen Meyer. I haven't seen it yet. School. I don't think. It goes like this. Life started out with very simple forms, and then gradually, over hundreds of... Wait, I think I did. Yeah, I did, but I haven't, I haven't seen it in a while. I gotta look. Millions of years. Morphed into all the forms we see today. Bacteria to Beethoven. Not a straight line, of course, but that's roughly how it went. This was the theory proposed by Charles Darwin in 1859, and with some modification, it's been embraced as unassailable by the scientific community over the last century. As evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins says, if you meet somebody who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is either ignorant, stupid, or insane. But is that right? Are there no scientific reasons to doubt the evolutionary account of life's origins? In November 2016, I attended a conference in London convened by some of the world's leading evolutionary biologists. The purpose? To address growing doubts about the modern version of Darwin's theory. Let's look at just two scientific reasons to doubt this theory. First, the Cambrian explosion. Yeah. A weird and wonderful thing happened 530 million years ago. A whole bunch of major groups of animals, what scientists call the phyla, appeared abruptly within a geologically short window of time, about 10 million years. These novel animal forms, exhibiting prototypes of most animal body designs we see today, emerged in the fossil record without evidence of earlier ancestors. Did you catch that? A huge number of diverse animals appeared with no discernible antecedents. So where did they come from? This question really bothered Darwin, and he acknowledged that he could give it no satisfactory answer. Nor can scientists today. The renowned biologist Eugene Koonin of the National Center for Biotechnology Information describes the abrupt appearance of the Cambrian animals and other organisms, such as dinosaurs, birds, flowering plants, and mammals, as a pattern of biological big bangs. So what caused all these new forms of life to arise? That question leads to a second big doubt, the DNA enigma. In the 1950s, James Watson and Francis Crick made a startling discovery. The DNA molecule stores information as a four-character digital code. Four-chord song, guys. DNA is a four-chord song. Strings of precisely sequenced chemicals inside the DNA helix store the instructions, the information, for building the crucial proteins that cells need to survive. Unless the chemical letters in the DNA text are sequenced properly, a protein molecule will not form. No proteins, no cells. No cells, no living organisms. Bill Gates has said DNA is like a software program. Let's think about that for a second. For computers to run faster and perform more functions, they require new code. Well, the same is true for life. To build new forms of life, the evolutionary process would need to produce new genetic information, new code. But this raises questions about the creative power of natural selection and mutation. Natural selection is a simple sorting process. Species keep favorable mutations that allow them to survive, but eliminate bad mutations that cause their members to die out. No one doubts that natural selection is a real process and that it produces minor variations. But many biologists now doubt that it produces major innovations in biological form. To see why, think again about software. What happens if you introduce a few random changes into computer code? You'll likely mess it up, right? Though it might still work if you don't make too many changes. But if you make enough random changes, your program will stop functioning altogether. You certainly can't keep doing this and expect some cool new program to pop out. There's a mathematical reason for this. In all codes and languages, there are vastly more ways of arranging characters that will generate gibberish 
then there are arrangements that will generate meaningful sequences. True. And this applies to DNA. Remember, natural selection only selects sequences that random mutations generate. Yet experiments have established that DNA sequences capable of making stable proteins are extremely rare, and thus really hard to stumble on randomly. How rare? Well, here's the issue, is that mathematically, and Eric Weinstein said this too, on Brian Keating's podcast, randomness doesn't exist. And because randomness doesn't mathematically exist, it cannot be the engine for, um, for biological evolution. It can't. And so that whole argument of random mutations cause them, it's just, it's nonsense. While working at Cambridge University, molecular biologist Douglas Ack showed that for every DNA sequence, that generates a relatively short functional protein, there are 10 to the 77th power non-functional sequences. Now consider that there are only 10 to the 65th power atoms in our galaxy. So finding a new DNA sequence capable of building a functional protein is like searching blindfolded for a single marked atom among a trillion Milky Way galaxies. Talk about a needle in a haystack. As I show in my book, Darwin's Doubt, even four billion years of life's history is not enough time to overcome a search problem this big. So two serious doubts about modern Darwinian th stupid or insane. They are just appropriately skeptical. See, okay, here's the issue. And this is why I never paid too much attention to this guy. And it's not that I don't, you know, appreciate what he's trying to do. Obviously I do. But... A lack of evidence is not evidence. It's not. And his evidence is a lack of evidence. It's this God of the gaps. And God is not in the gaps. There are no gaps. There's no gaps. You don't need gaps to explain God. You need context. And so... I'm excited to see what he has to say. You know, this was every... I feel like hopefully he's come a little bit further with this. As, you know, he says the return of the God hypothesis is his new book. That means hopefully that there's something... come. There's science coming out that's supportive of what he has, uh, you know, been espousing. About the... That the, you know, God is a more logical explanation than a lack of God, but there's evidence of God everywhere when you look at my work, and that is mathematical evidence, and uh, when you understand the mathematics of DNA, not just, oh, well, you know, there's 77, you know, million or trillion, whatever he said, billion, you know, instances where it wouldn't have worked, but one instance where it did. This is not evidence. It's evidence that there's something going on. But it's not evidence. It's still a lack of evidence as evidence. But when you understand that the double helix is, you know, a triality of observed uh, perspectives, and that Watson and Crick actually had a triple helix by accident uh, to start, which makes sense because there's past, present, and future. There's length, width, and height. There's um, electron, muon, and tau. There's these trialities observant everywhere that we look, but when you understand the patterns in sentient singularity theory, you realize that it is... Uh, it is... A duality of degrees of freedom leading to a triality of observed perspectives and one intrinsic constraint between the two of them. So it's not the A form, the B form, and the Z form. It's the A form and the B form reflecting across the intrinsic constraint that is the Z form in DNA. You understand that the double helix, you know, they're, they're each of these helixes or heli, I don't know what it would be, actually. If anybody knows the plural of helix, let me know. But that there is 
a helical diameter of 19, and you see why that is emergent from the structure of mind itself, then, you know, and then that pattern isn't just found on DNA, it is found in the universe itself. Then you can see that there, the evidence for God is not a lack of evidence, it is evidence. God is not a God of the gaps, there are no gaps. There's just God. And the more that you understand the math of objective structures, like the DNA double helix, like the standard model in, in quantum mechanics, the more that you understand that there is no evidence for lack of God, other than the fact that you can't see him. But that isn't even evidence, because there is no evidence for forced existing, you could say, if you're in the forest, you can't see the forest in its totality. You can see evidence of forest all around you, but you can't see the forest while you're in the forest. You can't see the forest through the trees. You can't see God because you're in him. It's not a problem. It makes perfect sense. In fact, it would be a problem if you could. If you could see God uh always like you know just whenever you want it not saying he can't step into his own creation i'm not saying he can't you know this is a theological debate i'm not saying he can't step into his own creation but i am saying that you can't see the totality of god ever ever and maybe he can show you an objective perspective but even then it's still going to be subjective compared to his level of objective perspective which is just another level you can't see it so i'm excited um for the talk tomorrow and we'll talk about it afterwards maybe god might be in that 10 to 77 unexplained dna Maybe, I mean, God's in all DNA, explained DNA and unexplained. It's not, it's not just uh, the unexplained. And, you know, we're, we're going to talk a, a lot about the evidence of, the direct evidence of mind this week, but I want to see his talk tomorrow. And, um. just you know then we can talk about it but like i said it is it is partially a pandemic that's letting us even question these things or not letting us but causing people to question these things and you know there's you're gonna see both sides uh you know you're gonna see people who double down on you know looking back and becoming pillars of salt you're gonna see people constantly complaining about you know kids need to be in schools they haven't even realized that their schools are causing all the problems and um you're also gonna see hopefully the rise of people who embrace the change to come and ask themselves what is it that god is trying to teach us because he's always trying to teach us Whenever change happens, there's something to be learned. We're going through an enormous amount of change over the past couple of years. And, um, you know, I'm personally, it's, I understand it's unnerving, but I also am excited. And, um, you know, I wouldn't be here, I don't think, speaking to you guys, if it wasn't like this and streaming every night if it wasn't for his moving of things and destroying of old structures in my life. So just because something old is destroyed does not mean that something new is not coming. Something new is coming. So definitely, like I said, check out Brian Keating's podcast, Into the Impossible. Tomorrow at 8 a.m. there will be a uh, talk with Stephen Meyer. We're going to talk about it tomorrow uh, on our stream. 
And also in the link in the description of this video on YouTube, as well as in my bio on Instagram, there is a link to our Discord. We had a great discussion, literally went on for like five hours or four hours or something like that last week. I want to uh, have that again later this week, get to know you guys, have another great chat. I learned so much from you guys. And um, now that I kind of got to know some of you, I want to delve more into the work even than we even did last time. Um, that should be a really good time. Uh, check out sundayandsingularitytheory.com. Sign up for my email list at the bottom of my homepage because we will definitely be censored uh, at some point. We're going to have to jump from platform to platform until we eventually make our own, uh, which we will. And then uh, if you'd like to support this work on Patreon, uh, you can check out the support page on my website, sentientsingularity.com. And um, uh, there's different options for Patreon there. I'm still getting everything worked out as far as what, uh, you know, the various tiers will allow, but, you know, one step at a time always. But I really appreciate you all being here. Happy Passover. I love this holiday. Look into the story of it. Um, I highly suggest that you contemplate it, whether you're Jewish or not Jewish, it doesn't really matter. The Torah is the matrix of creation itself, and we are all part of that creation. So I will see you all tomorrow. I'm keeping it kind of short tonight because it's Passover. Uh, but I really appreciate you all being here. And let me make sure there's no final questions. And then I will get off. So I talk with him, a computer scientist and a philosopher. They have some amazing information. Awesome. Um, I subscribe to the theory that history is a lie agreed upon. To some degree, it is a lie agreed upon. But it's like a white lie. Or not a white lie. It's like... It's like a combination of the truth and lies. That's what I'm trying to say. I don't know if there's a word for that. It's a partial lie. Uh, I saw it... Uh, it sounded like Stephen Meyer was saying the problem with things that he was critiquing was they are skeptical at best, but science, non-believer scientists, take these things as 100% true. Exactly. Anyways... Thanks again, guys. I will see you tomorrow. And uh, if you watch the stream uh, on Brian Keating's podcast at 8 a.m., which is Into the Impossible on uh, YouTube, I would love to hear your thoughts about it as well. And I will talk to you tomorrow. Peace.